Cool. Yeah, hello everyone. So I'm Michael. This is uh, Botam. We're both data analysts from Sam Knows. And uh, in this talk, we're going to tell you a little bit about the R packages and the tools that we've implemented over the past year, year and a half, in order to automate the work that we do. Uh, we're going to talk about the Monarch repository that pulls it all together. And along the way, we'll give you a little bit about the world of internet performance measurement. And uh, yeah, so with, without further ado, before I go anywhere, I, th I think actually, before I go there, um, it's worth mentioning that the tools that we're going to talk about today, you know, by themselves could probably have a presentation that lasts 20 minutes. So it's going to be quite a quick fly through of all these different um, tools in the hope of maybe empowering some of you to say, Oh, I could do that in one of my in one of my scripts when you go away. Okay, yes. So before I start on the tools, uh, we've got to tell you a little bit about what Sam Knows does. So we are a company that focuses on internet performance measurement. Uh, our goal or mission is to provide accurate data, basically on how the internet is performing in the hopes of improving the internet for everyone. As it says up there, there's about 20 billion tests running each month across millions of homes. And it's probably very likely that some of you are actually running Sam Knows right now in your homes and you don't even know it. So for example, Virgin Media, they're running about, I'd say there's probably about 5 million devices running across the UK. and. Uh, I think it's important, I think I have to say this, that we don't track your internet activity. I feel like I have to put my hands up and say that. Um, rather, we run a number of different tests, probably some that you'd expect, like uh, download, upload speed, latency, that kind of thing. But recently, people are kind of moving away from those metrics and are becoming more interested in their user experience. So things like you know, you're watching a YouTube video and it's taking ages to, to buffer, or maybe you're on a Teams call and your presenter has just frozen and you have no idea what they're saying. So we take all of that data that we produce and it's fed into our platform called Sam Knows One, which offers a variety of products that essentially give your internet service provider the ability to kind of check your performance and their network performance as a whole. So we have a variety of data analysts as well, many of whom are here today. I think all of them are here today. And essentially what we do day to day is get our hands dirty with R and essentially create bespoke reports that will you know, tell these internet service providers the results from anywhere between a single home all the way to summarizing the performance of the networks across an entire country. So you can see there on the right hand side, you've got the measuring broadband report that was put out recently. And yeah, that covered off the uh, main networks in, in New Zealand. So that's a little bit about what we do as Sam knows. I'm going to pass over to Botan and he's going to tell you a little bit more about what we do with R day to day. Okay. Uh, we use R and R Markdown in our everyday, everyday workflow. And basically, we pull some data from database in R and process it, visualize it, analyze it in R, and convert into a report using R Markdown or Carta Markdown, which is great. But last year, we were getting some recurring requests. And some of these recurring requests actually didn't require any interactive attention. We could just set a script and update the parameters, and we could run the report, get the results, and ch share the results manually. But in the, at the end of the day, any of us really want to sit front of our desk and wait the correct reporting time, and run the report manually, and check the results manually, and share the report manually. So we needed the automation. But even though if we are going to have automation, the first question was, where are we going to have this automation? Because if we, if we automate this pipeline on our local machines, what are we going to do? Are we going to leave our laptops 24 hours open? So we don't want to do this. We needed a server. And the benefit of working in a tech company, it was easy, easy for us to set up a, our host. 
and run our pipeline on this server. But the thing is, we really didn't want to SSH in server and do all the coding bits in Vim. We needed a better place for development environment. And we need something we already use every day. We already familiar. And the solution for us was using RStudio server, which is an open source web-based interface for R. And it allows us to access the platform from any device. It streamlines our teamwork with a consistent dev environment and provides a dev environment nearly identical to production. That's great, now we have a place to work. We need to schedule our jobs, we need to schedule our scripts. And in our case, the most simplest solution was just using cron. And cron is a time-based job scheduler in Unix-based systems, and it's quite straightforward to use for repetitive tasks. You can just type cron tab e and you can set your task. This piece of code is basically every Monday to Friday at nine o'clock, change the working directory, run this R script, and append the standard output into log file. That's great, but this is an R conference. And there's a better way to do this. Even though cron itself is quite convenient, we found it more convenient using the R package cron R. And as you see here, the code itself is more human readable, and now, if we are using project-oriented workflow, we don't even need to mess with absolute paths, or we don't need to hard code our paths. Now, we started the automation, but what are we going to do with this, our reporting outputs? Yeah, so we no longer have the problem of having to just sit and hit go every time we want to run a script, uh, but we still have the problem of distributing the output of, of these jobs. And uh, one of the first tools that we implemented for this came from just a discussion with an internal account manager that basically said, this is a cool piece of work, we'd like to see it every morning in Slack. And that's essentially where we started. So we made use of the Slack R package, which accesses Slack's API and essentially gives you uh, the ability to create a new user that you uh, invite to the private channels that you want to communicate with and uh, gives you all the functionality that you'd expect from you know, sending a, a Slack message uh, uh, but using R instead. The only kind of tip we have for using this package is essentially Slack channel names don't uh, stay the same, they tend to change. So, but they have a unique ID, so we tend to go for that instead. So that's an internal way of distributing some of these uh, deliverables. Of course, we also need to distribute them external, externally to our clients, to the different ISPs. Um, and many of these ISPs have uh, an SFTP server, so a secure file transfer protocol server that uh, we send uh, a bunch of our raw data to for them to access. And so we use the SFTP package for this, and it was pretty simple to set up. All you really needed were the credentials of the SFTP server you were connecting with, and then you were able to communicate. So that's external distribution, but you know not all clients have access to an SFTP server, and of course the inevitable question came where, can you send this to, a, to an inbox? And we use Gmail at Samnos, so we made use of the Gmail R uh, package, which essentially gives you the functionality of being able to send an email, but through R. And uh, yeah, it was a little tricky to set this uh, package up for non-interactive usage, and uh, can also, you know, lead to a cost if heavy usage. Uh, uh, yeah, if we if we are using this package loads or if we're accessing uh, the Gmail API too much. Okay, so we've distributed some deliverables. Now we need to talk a bit about where we're gonna store them because if we've got 50 odd jobs running every day, you're gonna end up with far too many files to keep on top of. Okay, now we need to decide about what are we going to do with our, our reporting outputs because we don't wanna keep them on the server forever and we don't wanna delete them as well. So we need to put them in a safe place and we need to make them accessible for the rest of the organization. And at Samnos, we use Box as a cloud-based file sharing service. 
and Boxer is the R package for interacting with that API. The only thing we need to do is creating a service app for non-interactive usage. After the correct setup, we just need to authenticate, and if we already know the correct folder ID, we can upload the file with just single one function, but we found it more convenient using the RStudio project name in box as a directory name, so we could always reach the folder ID in this way. Okay, now we mentioned a couple of times. This pipeline actually relies on project-oriented workflow. And if the first line of our R secrets is setting our working directory or removing the objects from our environment, Jenny Bryan will take a plane and come to the UK and will set our computer on fire. So we didn't want to have this. And the solution for us, just organizing each project into an RStudio project, which guarantees that project can be moved around on different users on the server, and it will still just work since it doesn't require absolute paths. We also found useful to have project templates and following a standardized structure for our project workflow, which facilitates our, our collaboration and makes it easier to navigate for other team members. And we came up with package flavored uh, project workflow, which is basically any R script lives under R folder, any data coming from database goes under data, static data like lookup tables stays under data row, extra documentation or word templates goes under docs, and we also find it useful to separate our SQL scripts under SQL folder. That's cool, but now I have a pipeline. It works under my user, but if I need to hand over this work to Michael, is it going to work? So the answer was for us, it wasn't. And we needed to understand why. And the solution was for us using just RM to make our projects more isolated, more portable, and more reproducible. We could just use RM init, which initialized the RM, and it brings a project level library instead of using user level or system level library. And if we need to make changes, if we need to update a package or install a package, we can do it in the same way, but after that, we just need to run RM snapshot, which will update the log file we produced after RM init. But if we ever need to go back and use the previous version of that package, we can just use RM restore. The only downside with this approach is building packages from source on a Linux server can take time. Like, for example, Tideverse, it takes almost an hour. Now, okay, we have a pipeline, it works, it's more portable, more reproducible, more isolated, but where are we going to store all of this work? Like, if the R host goes away, what are we going to do? So, we need to safely version control our code, and we need to store them on a cloud. So, we use Git and GitHub, and it also helps us to manage our revisions and our collaborations. And also, we realize that if we need to create hundreds of different repo for our projects, how we are going to track them, and there will be too much admin work for giving access to repositories or creating the repositories or tracking them. So we simplify the whole workflow of just using a monorepo. And the last thing is, when we started this journey, because of we are just data analysts, we didn't even know what is production anyway. So we needed to understand code quality is matter, we needed to we needed to have a good workflow, good practices for production. So we started to get some benefit using this Git and GitHub, and we started to give code reviews to each other. And it helped us to audit our methodology, and it helped us to get more familiar to with each other's projects. Cool. Uh, yeah, so that was a very, very quick look at the kind of tools that we've been implementing over the past year or so. Um, and specifically those tools that focused on, you know, dealing with this uh, or, or dealing with having to manually execute your jobs, but then also distributing them afterwards. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that the approach that we've taken to this process is a pragmatic one. 
right? There are probably many other tools out there that we could use and maybe we'll go on to use in the future, but you know, this process meant having to implement these tools whilst also just trying to keep on top of the work we're doing day to day. Uh, so in the mono repository itself, there's about 20 to 30 of these jobs running at the moment, but we believe that there are a few other things that we need to think about moving over to the, moving to the future. So we already mentioned that we are using this, we are using this project oriented workflow, but we also realized that we have duplicated code across the projects. So whenever we need to make changes or we need to fix a bug, we need to go, we need to go all of these projects and make our changes. But instead of this, we could just use package oriented workflow and we could get rid of this duplication, duplicated code issue. And the other thing is we realized once while when we uh, design our pipelines, we didn't actually apply any unit tests. So the works was running a couple of months without any issue, then suddenly we were getting some errors and the work didn't distribute it. So we will start to use unit testing when we are designing our workflows from beginning. This is our short run goals. Cool, and then yeah, just before we wrap up, we can't really uh, uh, end without saying a few thank yous to the RStats community. Obviously the package authors that we spoke about and obviously Jumping Rivers for letting us talk today. Um, and yeah, so as I said, there's about 20 to 30 jobs running at the moment, but we'll see, maybe there'll be hundreds in the future and maybe at that point we'll have another talk for you <laughs> where we talk about the new problems that we, that we ran into. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.